Um, so welcome to this first research panel of the conference. It's a real pleasure to welcome so many of you here in person, but we also have a um, substantial audience connecting online, as well as one of the speakers. Um, so uh, what we will talk today um, at this panel is digitalization and the way it changes and also create and brings challenges to the employment relationship, employment relations, and uh, work organization. So the place where all those, uh, all, all the challenges kind of uh, are visible in sharp focus is the online platform economy. And for this reason, some of the speakers today will specific, specifically focus on online labor markets and uh, online labor platforms. Um, but this is not the whole story. There's also the whole um, segment of, of the offline or traditional labor market where many of the trends or technological solutions used in platform labor are also adopted to manage and to manage labor and organize uh, the work process. So we'll talk about those. One of them is remote work, uh, of course. So this is the challenge related mostly to the um, organization of dispersed workforce, but it also together with platform economy, um, it brings new challenges. So it's important to understand to what extent um, the underlying inequalities in the labor market might be further exacerbated by the technological change and to what extent new lines of inequality might be drawn by those solutions in both, uh, as I said, managing employment relations, so changing the contractual relationship between employers and workers, and also the way work is organized. Um, we have four speakers, uh, three of them here with me and one uh, online. So in order, order of appearance, I will just very briefly introduce them. Uh, we start with Walter Zwissen, who is senior researcher at ETY. Um, the second speaker is Umarani, who is senior, senior economist um, at the research department at ILO, and she's uh, with us online. Hello, Uma. Um, the first speaker is Pamela Mail, who is uh, associate senior research fellow in the Institute for Social Science Research in Munich. And uh, last but not least, Birte Weben, um, who is director of the ICTS uh, sector at Uni Europa here in uh, Brussels. So quite diverse range of speakers. The challenge is to uh, try to narrow down so much uh, knowledge that they have uh, prepared to share with us in uh, the time slot that we have allocated. So I will please uh, I'll ask the speakers to stick with 12, 15 minutes um, time frame, which should give us some time for the discussion afterwards. And those who are listening in online, there is a Q&A function in Zoom. So please post all your questions there. We will read through them uh, during the panel and then try to discuss this, uh, try to address as many questions as we will be able um, at the end. So I'll give a floor to Walter and I hope you can um, see your slides. We can. Okay, thank you very much, Agnieszka. Um, yes, so let's see if my slides can uh, appear on the screen. If not, I'll talk you through the figures, but it will be substantially more boring. <laughs> Good, great. Um, and let's see, yes, no. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to draw okay. attention to our new logo of the survey as well. So it's the yes, weather, weather forecast type of, uh, of a logo, but um, <laughs> the new visual we are adding to the presentation. Okay, um, I can't seem to change the slides. So I'll start clicking a bit. And if not, I'll just say when I uh, when I have to change them. Can I change them? Ah, who did that? <laughs> okay, now it seems to react a bit. Okay, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> anyway, we'll wing it. Um, <laughs> it's the first session, so we need to get uh, figure all this out. It's it's really a pleasure to be able to speak to all of you uh, today on this topic. Thank you, Agnieszka, very much for uh, convening this and for the introduction. So I'll give a short presentation today about some of the work we've been doing on this topic, mainly on internet and platform work at the ETUI. And I will show some results of, the, uh, of a big survey we've been carrying out, mainly from the spring and autumn waves of 2021 from the ETUI internet and platform work survey. As Agnieszka said, we're trying out a new logo as well now, which is a cloud 
hence see the internet platform stuff and then showing all the activities you can do but we really want to stress the fact that it's very diverse and much more diverse than only uh driving or, or delivery work okay so if i just click at random it works which is perfect um the goal of this survey was really to try and get some numbers and some perspective on just how many people are participating in these online labor markets in this internet and platform work because it's a super important topic. There's all this work on the future of work. There's all this uh, policy work going on as well. But actually, quite often, we don't know very much um, who does it, how many people do it, and, and just how big of a phenomenon it is. One of the reasons for that is that uh, a lot of the surveys that are being done or have been done use a sort of convenience sample or quota sample, which relies more on people who are already more likely to do platform work. So the main thing we wanted to do in this topic, uh, and Agnes and Jan mainly who started with it, was to try and use simple random samples of people and get a perspective of how many people across Europe use platform work. So there was a first wave in 2018, 2019 in five Central and Eastern European countries that was uh, done by Jan Drahokopil, who now left the ETY, and Agnieszka, um, who still is at the ETY. And then there was a bigger follow-up wave in uh, 2021. Because of COVID, this was not done face to face, but through uh, random digit dialing and telephone interviews. And uh, it was done by Ipsos. This covered 14 European countries with a uh, relatively good regional spread. We miss one region, Scandinavia, and that is essentially purely for reasons of cost. But we cover uh, quite a lot of the European population with these 14 countries. And then in the autumn of 2021, there was a follow up uh, wave of eight countries. Um, with slightly small examples in uh, France, Spain, Italy, and Germany. And again, 1,750 people in Czechia, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Estonia. Um, and when I'm discussing results today, they will be mainly from the spring and sometimes from spring and autumn surveys. Um, to briefly talk about the concepts we're using. So I'm talking about internet and platform work. We see internet work as a very wide type uh, of activities. These are all types of things you can do online to earn money. Uh, we asked about nine, th nine different activities, and then a subset of those uh, we classify as platform work. That's the subset of labor tasks, remote click work, which are these micro tasks like filling in service or small tasks, remote professional work, which can be uh, creative professional work like IT or translation, on location work, uh, which in our data was very often handyman work or babysitting or tutoring, uh, transport work, think of Uber or Lyft, and delivery. And the subset of people who do those tasks and who do them through what we classify as a platform, that's a relatively strict definition. That means they were matched directly to clients and uh, the money was handled by the platform. Those are the platform workers. So when I mean internet work, it's these different types of activities. When I say platform work, it's really the subset of labor tasks carried out through platforms. This comes from the spring, uh, from the results from the spring survey. And it's just an overview of uh, how many people we're talking about now who do, who have any experience with this. So we find that about 71% have never done any uh, type of these activities to make money on, uh, on the internet. And of the remaining 29%, this falls apart in, in uh, only 17% who have done it in the last year. So that's a relatively big group, actually. It's, uh, if you take it over the whole of the EU, you're coming to an estimate of 47 million. Of course, that's an estimate because this comes from a survey. And we do see that it's relatively stable across countries. So we extrapolate there. Um, and among these internet workers, a far smaller group of about 4% in total are platform workers. And a quarter of those people uh, are what we classify as main platform workers. A main platform worker does this platform work, but it does it at least 20 hours per week or makes more than half of their income through it. So that's really the, the intensive users, if you want. Now, those are not incredibly big numbers. They're slightly smaller than what comes up uh, in, for instance, the Colleen survey or some of the other uh, studies. But it's not unimportant because, first of all, we're still talking about a lot of people in the EU itself. And secondly, we're also using a relatively conservative estimate. And there's all these internet workers, many of whom do platform-like activities as well and have the scope of, of growing into that. And then also, if we look at when people started doing the platform work, for a large part of them, it was only in the last year. So there's quite a lot of growth in it. Um, now I will talk a bit about what we find in terms of what sort of activities are being done, who does it, 
and what can we say about their, uh, their work conditions? First of all, with this slide, I just want to highlight that it's a variety of tasks and the most common are actually people doing these micro tasks, this remote click work. So small tasks online, um, transport and delivery, which are more commonly thought of as, as the platform work are relatively less common. And then we have uh, remote professional and location work as well at similar levels. And um, the amount of people who do these tasks at least weekly is relatively small, generally on the 1%. Uh, of the, the population we're talking about here. Now I'm going to show results from um, the spring and the autumn waves together. So this is showing in the average country and, and just who does the, the platform work. So what's the probability of doing main platform work for different categories of people uh, by age and gender, by qualification levels, and then by country of birth. First of all, there's some gender difference. So generally men are more likely to do uh, platform work. But when you dig deeper into this, that really differs a bit by tasks. So men are much more likely to do things like delivery or transport work. Women are generally somewhat more likely to do these micro tasks. And then they're more or less equal when it comes to the remote professional work. Um, and, and women are somewhat more likely to do on location work as well. So there's a big difference there in, in um, the tasks, but overall men are more likely. There's also a gender difference, uh, an age difference, sorry with the people over 35 being less likely to do platform work, but crucially not, uh, it's still about 1% of women over 35, that's not nothing. So what we wanna highlight here as well is there's sometimes this idea of it's student work, young people earning a bit extra. I mean, some of it is that, yes, but definitely not all. There's a wide variety of people doing platform and internet work. By qualifications, we see it's mainly the people who are slightly more highly qualified, but the difference isn't huge. And then when we're looking at country of birth, um, it's more likely uh, for people born in non-EU countries, especially uh, the non-Western third countries. So we see a bit of difference by age and gender, by qualifications, and then also migrants are more likely to, uh, to work on platforms. Now, a second important thing to look at is the relation with, we also ask people what their main uh, labor market position is. And it's quite important to see how this interacts with the, the, the main job. Um, because there's sometimes this idea that it's something done that replaces work and that's being done mainly by people who are not employed. That's not really true. If you look at internet workers, platform workers, and offline uh, and, and people who don't work on the internet, about 70% of all of them are employed. But the type of employment does differ. Uh, Self-employed are much more likely to be engaged in platform work. There might be some uh, overlap there with them thinking it's a, reporting it as a main job. The unemployed are slightly more likely, but not shockingly so. As with age, there's a slightly overrepresentation of students, but again, that's by no means all of them. Um, and so there is a bit of a difference with the type of work people are already doing. Takeaway from these demographics um, is what I already said. So differences by gender, by age, uh, migration, education. But the crucial thing here is that when we look at, we compare our results to uh, studies like Colleen, for instance, or, or other studies out there, the difference we find are somewhat less stark. So we don't see it as a completely different group of workers. Um, and that is quite crucial because that means you don't have to treat it as a completely different type of work or as people who only do like a student job or something. Um, it is, uh, any problems have to be addressed also like they should be in the main labor market. Now talking about those problems, this is just, the survey is designed to talk about prevalence, but when you pull everyone together, you can say something about the conditions as well of work. Perfect. Um, and here I'm showing the median hours work per week for platform workers of different types, the median earnings uh, per month, and then in countries where there is a statutory minimum wage, if we make an approximation of the hourly wage by just dividing the earnings divided by the time, uh, what percentages earn below the minimum wage. So when you're looking at all platform workers, they work, the median one works seven hours per week. Uh, in a typical month earns 140 euros and half of them work on an hourly rate that's below the minimum wage. When you look at main platform workers, so these are specifically selected on being uh, more likely on, on working harder and, uh, and getting a bigger share of their income. That's 22 hours per week for the median one and earning 400 euros but still in terms of rates, many earn below the minimum wage. Then the only important differences there are that 
people who do remote click work tend to work the least per week, five hours. People doing remote professional work tend to work the most, 10 hours. And there's wage difference as well, but that can be explained a bit by the composition. So I'm very briefly going to talk about an extension we're doing, um, where we're trying to say, OK, so what's the variation between countries and regions? And to what extent can we explain a bit how offline labor markets relate to, to the probability of working online? And what I'm showing here is uh, per region, what's the share of people doing internet work? And the main point there is that it varies over countries, but also within countries between regions. And one of the things it varies with is that indeed, if we look at what are your regional opportunities for work, given your characteristics and the, the place you live, we find that um, the higher the offline labor market opportunities are, the less likely people tend to be to work online and to do remote work, especially. Uh, final extension I'm going to talk very briefly about is that we also have some information on telework. We asked in the survey whether people already worked from home before the COVID and whether what changed uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, so these are results from the spring panel asking about the last year. So from spring 2021 to, uh, well, March, April 2020. Um, so the main point here to show is that there was uh, unsurprisingly a big increase in telework in most uh, countries. And this matches quite well the data from the LFS, which is important for us to know from the, the uh, to select the validity, the validity of the sample. And importantly, when we're looking at the probabilities of teleworking for platform workers, not platform workers, we find that generally people who uh, did platform work were also more likely to work from home more often at their jobs. So there's some overlap there. Uh, but they were not more likely to work more intensively at home as a result of the COVID. It's just the question whether they work more or more likely to start. So this was a very, very brief overview of some of the data we have. Sorry if I went slightly over time. Um, and this is uh, just a picture of the booklet you can get with our working paper. Please do have a look and then come talk to me afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so it, it, is an, it is a snapshot, it's a very brief picture and that analyzes data from Europe, but already it's clear that um, internet or online work is not erasing inequality. So you could see that on one hand, uh, there is the gendered pattern in types of tasks performed. And on the other hand, this type of labor markets is developing along other dividing lines of, of the segmentation, such as increased vulnerability of workers being associated with, with platform work. But that's the European picture. Now we will ask uh, Umarani to show us a more global perspective that also brings another layer of, of inequality, which is regional one. So Uma, the floor is yours. Uh, and I will try to, to keep time, but um, okay. if you don't see me, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I, I won't be able to see you, but I'll try to keep the time. Oh, we don't hear you. Hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Agnesia, and I will share my slide. And I think this is a, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, I think I'm gonna start off where uh, Buta was talking about, not very different and very similar to the traditional labor market. And I think this is something that is very, very important for us to keep in mind, especially from a policy perspective. Now, there is this entire notion that has been created that these work, whether it is online labor market platforms or uh, location-based platforms are creating new jobs. This is not really true, except for probably certain types of micro task and some delivery work. Much of it exists in the traditional labor market and actually technology is being used to mediate workers with clients and with consumers. So I think this is something for us to keep in mind as we go into the discussion, because at the policy level, what applies to the traditional labor market would apply also to the platform labor market. So what I'm gonna present is coming out from the report that came out in 2021 from the ILO on role of digital labor platforms in transforming the world of work. And one of the reasons I thought of showing this particular slide is the headline figure that we do give there is the rise of platform over the past decade. And I think this is something very, very important for us to have in mind, which has been fivefold. And there's also, again, concentration of these platforms in largely 
uh, United States where it's one third, and then you have India and UK having 8% and 5%. But in terms of both investments and revenues, you see a complete digital divide there. You have revenues, which is dominated by two countries, US and China with 70%, and investments, Latin America, Africa, Middle East only have 4%, and much of it goes to Asia Pacific, Europe, and the US. So that's the kind of distribution that is there with regard to the platforms and that's where the investments are going in and it's important to keep in mind. It's no surprise that digital labor platforms have been rising. It's largely because of the importance of data. It's feeding into the machine learning algorithms, the availability of capital venture capital funds. And we've also seen that it's become very increasingly relevant since the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, what I'm going to present to you is go a bit more in depth to what from what Wouter was talking about and show you what are the kinds of tasks and what is the kind of returns that you have in the end and how there are certain differences between countries. So I'm going to use the online web-based worker surveys that we did in about 100 countries across the different platforms, microtask, freelance, competitive programming. And we also did country-specific surveys in China and Ukraine. And our primary objective was to be as representative as possible. And we tried to have workers who were aged above the age of 18 years and who had at least worked for three months so that we could capture what their uh, work experience was. So we do know, uh, as we have been talking to businesses for this particular report, that you know, right from the startups to Fortune 500 companies have been using digital labor platforms for different purposes for reducing costs, improving efficiencies, accessing knowledge for innovations, recruitment, but it is also used to set up new AI startups and to transform the existing BPO companies and to expand them, largely because uh, you know it doesn't cost today too much to set up a business virtually compared to what it would be traditionally, largely because you can rent a lot of cloud computing infrastructure and cloud infrastructure, and you can use a lot of labor from digital labor platforms for a very low cost. So you see this expanding to a very large extent. Now, how are the actually businesses are actually using? So microtask platforms are used for two purposes. One is for AI machine learning purposes, where you have a whole range of tasks for data collection and uh, categorization, transcribing, and you have a lot of automobile companies who are actually using them for image annotation. Then you have companies using for audio image recording, which is again towards AI machine learning, and you have as a result of Web 2.0 and the rise of uh, more web internet coming in, today it's become very important to moderate content. And one might assume that a lot of that is done by AI, but actually it's microtaskers or crowd, uh, crowd workers on these platforms who actually clean a lot of that web, or it is outsourced to BPO companies in developing countries who actually go through all of this unobject, uh, objectionable material and actually clean it up. The second thing that we see where it's being used is for the promotion of products and services, like for instance, content taxes or market research reviews. To give you a quick example of what it looks like, your right-hand side of the slide is one which is about promoting products or services. And here, what you see is it's a task which is restricted to certain parts of the world, which is very important to note. And second is it mentions that it takes only three minutes to finish. And if you look at the written material there, it very clearly takes four minutes to do the task and more time to actually go through what is required. And much of this is today when you want any product or service and you're looking at the web, you uh, you Google it and you have some things coming up and you are thinking that, oh, well, this is the most used product or services by many people, but actually it's humans behind the computer who are actually clicking it away and actually getting these platforms up. So if you have a website, you can pay $100 per month and have your website 
on the top, which is done by humans. So there's a lot of moral ethical issues again here. And the second, uh, on the left-hand side, what you see is a video, which is very clearly for an AI purpose, where you're asked to do certain actions and actually upload it. And you have to do 40 videos for which you are paid 1.20. Uh, euros, which clearly speaks about the kind of returns you have on the labor. Now, there are a number of challenges related to workers on these microtask uh, platforms. First is that of the employment relationship, where they are identified as or classified as self-employed or independent contractors. But much of it, when you see the entire process, and look at the relationship that exists between the worker, the client, and the platforms is very clearly that of the subordinate relationship as everything is algorithmically controlled and workers do not really have any autonomy and control over the work they actually do. The second issue that we do see is the work earnings with regard to how much they earn uh, per hour, which is very, very low. It's about $3.3 per hour and the median earnings is further low. The reasons is largely because they do a lot of unpaid tasks to be able to access tasks. And there's also a very high risk of work being rejected because the entire process is very automated. And we had about 75% of the respondents saying they were being rejected. And 42% of all respondents said that more than 10% of their work was rejected. So to have any sort of a decent income, many of them actually end up working six to seven days per week and also working in the evenings between six and 10. Now, as all operations are algorithmically managed, there's very little human interaction. So when there's a work rejected, and sometimes it's not justifiable, there's no way to uh, get in touch with any human in, in the entire process. And platforms and clients very clearly say that the cost of you know, getting in touch with uh, any of the workers are far too high for them. So they do not really want that process being in, built in. But from a worker viewpoint, I think the problem is if you do not know what went wrong, you can never correct it. So there is a sort of a frustration that is being built in among a lot of these workers. And there's absolutely no proper dispute resolution mechanism on most of these platforms. If it exists, it's very, very limited. There's been some attempts to actually put certain things in force with the support of Ige Metal, but it's still not to the extent that it should be. And the levels of social protection are quite low. The two things I do want to show with regard to microtask workers is the differences we find in the early earnings. We looked at Amazon Mechanical Turk where we had a very good uh, sample of both American and Indian workers. And you find that on average, American workers earn 2.5 times as much as Indians. And if you look at the median earnings, it's even the disparity is even more wide. Now, part of the reason why you have this is largely because you might think that platforms being technology are neutral and there could be equity that can be achieved, but actually because you can take the decision to restrict what work goes to whom, you find that the kind of tasks that goes to American workers are much better paid tasks compared to Indian workers who get the low paid tasks. And part of that variation actually comes because of that. We also looked at a comparison between the traditional labor market and the platform labor market doing similar tasks for India and the US using the labor force survey. And this was even more shocking for us to see where the earnings on the platforms is about 64% less in India and 81% less in the United States, and women earn far lesser. This is you know, not taking into consideration any of the work benefits that workers might exist. So this is a kind of disparity one is talking about as a result of this new outsourcing model that is coming up. Now, if you look at freelance platforms, you find a whole range of services that is being done today, all of this being done in the traditional labor market. But I think two interesting things that you see very clearly here is that one is that you find all tasks being done on all uh, in both developed and developing countries, but men do more technology related tasks compared to women. And we looked at one of the major platforms to see how the work processes or outsourcing takes place. And here you find very clearly that the work is outsourced largely from US, Canada, UK, and uh, Australia, 
to a large proportion of workers in developing countries, India, Philippines, Ukraine, Russia being some of the most, uh, uh, the countries where the inflow of work is coming. And one of the reasons why you do see that happening is because the median early earnings in India is far lower than that of what you can see in many of the developing countries. So there's very clear cost efficiency point that you see. The challenges are very similar to what you see on micro task. Further, there's algorithmic management that actually uh, gets even worse within the freelance platforms because of the way that the control mechanisms actually work. And uh, one thing that I'd like to quickly mention is that there's huge differences that can be observed between countries and, uh, and gender. And that's largely because of uh, the global competition of labor force that exists. So, you know, you have developing countries, workers earning 60% less than that of developed, largely because they underbid, they do uh, 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 task free of cost, largely to be able to access more, more work on the platforms and to have better ratings. And you do find gender gaps being existing within countries across platforms, though at the global level, there's a kind of mixed findings to we do have, but that's one of the other issues that you do find. I think one more thing that I'd like to point out is the high commission fees that workers paid out of the earnings, which is something that you do not find in the traditional labor market. And it's also in contrary to many of the international labor uh, standards, whether it's a convention of minimum wages or the private employment agency. Their workers, they hardly have any freedom and flexibility, uh, as it's often talked about, because they are monitored uh, through hardware and software. Uh, not only do they have to regularly put their hours worked, but they also have to send their screenshots and they have to be available during specific times. And this is something we find much more among developing country workers and among women workers. Now, the last one that I do want to touch upon is the competitive programming platforms, which is really the higher end of the occupations that you see where these workers would normally be hired by IT companies and who are at a very high end of the space scale. But today, a lot of this work is being outsourced to the competitive programming platforms to access not only creative ideas and knowledge of, for innovation, but also to build new capabilities and for recruitment. And this is all done through challenges and competition. To give you a quick example, Top Coder platform, which is one of the oldest platform, more than 23 years old, had a crowdsourcing healthcare initiative on lung cancer for a price money of just $55,000 for 10 weeks. It had 500 cont contestants, 62 countries participating, and they had about 45 AI solutions being submitted by 34 contestants. So the whole issue is the quality and speed with which you can provide solutions, diverse solutions, that's become the key. And you find companies today actually moving towards hybrid models uh, whether it is the ITBP outsourcing company or Google, which has huge implications on the workers. I'm going to skip some of these sli one slide and get down to one more point before closing, which is actually when we talk about the working conditions, I think it's important for us to look at also the relationship between formal education and access to work. And this is particularly important from the global south perspective where there's more and more delinking that is happening. Now, many of these decent work elements can be provided by the existing, uh, you know, fundamental principles and rights at work and labor standards. And we do see some sort of a regulation that is happening, but there is a sort of uh, diverse practices that is there. So we at the ILO have been largely arguing that we need a much more coordinated international policy dialogue between platform companies, platform worker associations, and the governments to really think about what needs to be done uh, to reduce these inequalities, to address some of these working condition uh, issues, not only within the labor law, but also algorithms and with regard to the data protection. Thank you so much for listening. Uh -huh. That was really, this was excellent and dense in, in evidence. Uh, it's really also interesting to see some of the issues perhaps hinted at in your presentation. To what extent those dividing lines that you show for the platform economy, they start to emerge in the offline economy that uses, for instance, remote work in traditional enterprise settings. Uh, we see also the same kind of demarcation of workers who are 
remote that uh, affects negatively their career chances, but also how the work process or the content of work needs to be changed so that it can be distributed, as you showed us, in a very short instruction, um, divided into those small tasks so that matching becomes efficient. So the, the, the impact on work is really much, it's broader than perhaps we can grasp by just thinking about the couriers. Uh, it, it's, um, the, the challenges are there and um, yeah, so uh, we will talk about solutions in a minute, but first we will give floor to Pamela Mail, um, who will guide us through the B2B, so the, the business strategies in using outsourcing and platform labor. And then we will move to solutions because the problems are, are clear. We'll see how we can approach them. Okay, uh, if I, okay. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Agnieszka and Ruta, for the invitation um, at the conference. So I'm going to... Hmm? I'm going to talk about B2B platforms, in particular business to business, because when we talk about platforms, um, and there are so many different kinds of them, and it always um, and we tend to concentrate on the platforms themselves, the working conditions in the platforms, and we tend to concentrate on the individuals. And then we somehow don't really think about, well, who are the companies who are actually outsourcing to them? Um, and what kind of work is it and so forth? So I decided I wanted to try to look at this in more detail. This is, okay, this slide got away from me, but it, things get under more control afterwards. Um, so um, when I was, first of all, B2B platforms are sort of the mainstream of this panel because in fact, they are remote. They're always, we're talking always about remote work. And of course it's always digitally mediated. Um, so, um, I didn't, I wasn't able, since I don't have this great data source that the ILO and the ETUI have, um, so that's a really good source about trying to know exactly the extent, but I wanted to look at which companies and which sectors are involved in the externalization of work to platforms, what type of activities are involved. And then to get to more um, questions of, is this really, uh, just outsourcing 2.0. There are links to the traditional labor marks as Uma pointed out, um, or are there new forms of transformation taking place, affecting occupations and skill sets and creating new forms of inequality? Um, so can we learn, are there new trends happening and so forth? And then in a sort of second wave, um, I also wanted to look at research that had already been done on outsourcing to try to understand it um, and that's global value chains and labor market segmentation and to see what we can learn from these approaches um, because these approaches helped identify and understand the development of inequality in patterns of an externalization. So the point is, what can they tell us now and can they lead to any more um, new um, ideas or solutions for um, regulation or how um, institutions can get involved in trying to redress some of the inequalities that um, these kinds of uh, platforms are causing. <clears throat> so for one thing, as um, a lot of other um, data and a lot of other studies have shown, um, companies outsource a wide range of tasks to platforms. So we've got coding, software development, data generation for algorithms, translating and transcribing texts, but we also, and that's sort of like the range of some micro task and lower level tasks. And then we have it, the, the range of creative and multimedia design, but we also have simple service functions and some engineering tasks. So there's a really very broad range of activities that are being outsourced to platforms. As we will see, however, they tend to be concentrated um, in particular areas and probably the future trends are more directed in these particular areas. Platforms also tend to specialize around the set of tasks and types of workers that they recruit that they can offer to companies. So um, 
it'll be we offer you coders or we offer you microtaskers for data entry for developing algorithms. Um, and they try to target certain kinds of markets. And of course, the platform landscape is extremely volatile. Um, platforms come and go, um, and also um, they merge. And so platforms also try to concentrate on regions and languages. So the, the Russian league, the platforms for the Russian language market or platforms for the uh, French labor market or so forth. So um, as we've seen in the last two presentations, many of the tasks are low skilled and poorly paid, um, often micro tasks. Some are highly skilled and wages are higher in things like design, software development, etc. <laughs> so getting more to the landscape of B2B platforms, um, I was personally rather surprised at the diversity of industries that externalize work to platforms, because I basically thought about it in terms of IT media and the digital economy, but in fact, uh, quite a lot of the work that companies externalize to platforms is in the auto industry, um, and you can imagine why, because of aut autonomous vehicles um, and pharmaceuticals and so forth, so companies in traditional industries. Um, another really interesting development in the landscape of B2B platforms is that um, platforms catering to companies are undergoing organizational shifts. So we had the typical ones, which had been call, called in various contexts, the triangular relationship, where we had the individual and the platform and the company. Um, and since the individual rarely talks to the company and actually is always going via, via the platform, I'm not sure that you could actually call that triangular, but anyway, it's some kind of shape. Um, and, but then there's this really interesting emergence of large complex platforms with multi-layer structures. So actually you have platforms subcontracting to other platforms, creating a platform type of network or a value chain. Um, these platforms, um, have different roles. So one is recruits workers, another manages registration and sign on, another manages the allegation, uh, allocation of tasks and day-to-day -day supervision. A third one provides the user interface to execute tasks and then yet another liaises with clients. And so these complex value chains are actually developing in the platforms, um, creating a kind of extension and lengthening of change, which we also see in typical kinds of global value chain outsourcing. So as with, uh, and another thing that seems to be appearing is that as with traditional value change uh, research across companies, there seem to be different relationships governing the externalization process. So some are just market-based where you say, okay, do this task for this much money. Um, but others are modular. We say, do this set of tasks for this much money, um, give us a solution. Others are trying to be more complex and project-based, like we'll um, tell us what you want, we'll get all the crowd workers, we'll manage them all together, put it all together for you, and then offer you this solution at the end. These are probably um, actually the rarest forms. Um, and I don't know how many people are actually involved in this in terms of numbers, but it is something that at least the platforms are trying to um, develop because, of course, monetarily, it's interesting for them. So that means that what we're seeing is some B2B platforms appear to be offering more comprehensive or uh -oh, <laughs> upgraded services, such as the coordination of activities, management of crowd work, et cetera. And therefore, there is also evidence of chains um, that are developing along platforms and a lengthening extension of trains. However, one of the major differences between this and traditional forms of global form outsourcing and upgrading processes is that there's really limited effects on work and employment outcomes for the workforces. And one of the reasons this is, is because <clears throat> There's no long-term relationship or integration in company processes the way, the way there is in traditional global value chains. And there's a very vague institutional anchor and no place bound continuity 
that means you can have a different platform, you give the work out to a different platform, it's a different place, they get different workers from somewhere else and so forth. Um, and so, and in fact, the tasks also, at least up to now, have really remained very much outside of main company processes and don't need to be reintegrated into their systems. And therefore that's another hindrance to upgrading. So you have, you know, micro task, data entry, algorithm development for autonomous vehicles, you know, that's a, a special thing that lies outside of general company processes, or you have somebody doing a web design or a logo. Well, that's outside of general company processes. So the next thing I wanted to look at was labor market segmentation and platforms um, as a way of trying to understand them. And um, the quote from a recent book, um, which was, uh, I think some of my colleagues were involved in, in fact, um, was uh, to say, have the quote that says, employers are the drivers of labor market segmentation. And we, maybe we could argue about that, but I thought that it was, um, a really good thing to try to remember. And in this case, we have the platforms as employers, also the companies as employers, both driving um, these kinds of labor market segmentations because there are clearly differentiated labor markets on platforms. It's mainly determined by skills, but also in the location of the platform. So um, low wage locations, high wage locations, um, employment conditions with much more precarity than others, and but non-standard work is the form everywhere. Um, and um, obviously, as Uma also mentioned, a lot of the several large B2B platforms are located in emerging economies. But the fact is that given the lack of re regulation and the difficulties in regulation, um, having it in a Western country doesn't necessarily ensure better protection. Um, it's also unclear if people can move across segments, um, um, as in earlier forms of labor market segmentation, which had a lot of discrimination, um, because you could imagine a micro worker also doing something else in another segment, but it is difficult to acquire skills or develop career paths, and core periphery distinctions don't change, so um, labor market segmentations persist. <clears throat> so. Um, this is just a table trying to identify different models of B2B platforms. And if you look at the second column, types of tasks and their distribution, you see the, the differentiation of micro work, which uh, you see the differentiation of, of freelancing, contests, integrated project-based activities. Those are the ones that we know and can identify pretty clearly. The other two cloud applications and data for um, artificial intelligence, app development, and algorithm development are actually sort of cross-cutting ones. They also belong in micro work and freelancing, um, but they, they can also belong to integrated project-based activities or potentially have uh, individuals with higher level skills doing stuff. Um, the platform examples, you can see that they're incredibly diverse, that there are a lot of them. Um, and in customer, the business ones, you can see that there's also quite a number of, number of businesses in quite a different number of sectors involved. Um, so looking at the first column, labor market segmentation, um, I tried to sort of link labor market segmentation with uh, particularly the type of tasks and their distribution. In micro work, what you have is anonymous, low-skilled tasks, low-wage click work, and it's individual based. So you give it to a, a person to do. Um, in freelancing, it's often personalized tasks and people get ratings and they're higher skilled. They have mid high to wage ranges, but it's also individual based. Um, you'll see people on platforms advertising themselves and as the software developer and telling you all the great ratings they have and all the great experience they have and all the great companies they have and so forth. It's a very personalized type of um, uh, advertisement. And in contests, you also have personalized, um, higher skilled, but it's a winner takes all, and it's also individual based. Um, in integrated project based activities, they can probably be both anonymous and personalized, higher skilled, higher wages, but they're platform driven because it's the platforms who are the ones who control 
the um, these types of activities. Um, they're the ones who create the projects, they're the ones who coordinate, they're the ones who manage. Um, in the other ones, there's a mix because as I said, you can have anonymous and low skilled, but you can also have range of wages. They're also platform driven and anonymous and personalized. You can have higher skilled range of wages, individual and platform work. So um, what we're seeing is through all of these developments is an increasing polarization between place-bound company employment, standard employment, and platform-based remote work. Um, and so we are also looking at potentially a really new division of labor. Um, <clears throat> and we are seeing new lines of segmentation appearing um, and that are, I, I, I didn't see too much gender and B2B platforms differences, partly because a lot of the men do the technical activities, which is a lot of the activities that uh, companies are outsourcing to platforms. There are core periphery differences um, because micro tests take place a lot in emerging economies. On the other, there are a large platforms in Australia, America, wow. and so forth. Um, you have the same types of outcomes in previous forms of labor market and cementation um, that we see in B2B platforms, and also many of the same types of outcomes from familiar in GVCs. So I just wanted to try to have a said way to Peter <laughs> by sort of trying to think a little bit about um, things about how you move more toward equality with what kind of measures you can use. Um, and when you look at things and think about them in terms of institutionalization on the one hand and voice or grassroots or bottom up and um, activities on the other or group actions, um, you can have a difference between top down and bottom up and um, you get kind of different outcomes and probably kind of different prioritizing of topics. Um, in the right hand quadrant, you would have more trade union type based activities, which have high levels of institutionalism, but also um, a high level of voice. Um, in the bottom one, you would have uh, more grassroots ones, and they might be really great, but they might not be very sustainable unless they can move up into the institutional section. Um, and so um, just wanted to try to develop a kind of uh, way of understanding these patterns um, and saying that, well, you have to think about what topics you want to look at, in specific, especially with, re with regard to platform work, what your targets for action are, and also what kind of areas or types of action you want to take. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to the last speaker, Birte. Uh, tell us how to approach all those challenges, <laughs> what social actors can do, what is being done already. That's <laughs> how far are we in the right direction? So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, thanks for putting up my slides. I'm glad to they must appear. So yeah, thanks um, very much for inviting me. And I'm very happy to share um, some thoughts and reflections about remote work and this is not applying to remote work necessarily regarding platform work but this is really more a general approach to remote work in all different variations and uh, i'm actually talking about the unique key principles for remote work so just for setting the scene telework and remote work have been an issue for trade unions and for uni for a long time already we've been involved since 2015 and whatnot in different contributions to the ILO or at European level regarding telework so that has been something we've been following up on for a long time but of course with the pandemic this has been pushed forward and the agenda has changed so remote work or hybrid work um, has really become one of the top priorities for unions across Europe but I think globally really and so it's very key to include remote work principles into collective bargaining because actually linking up with what Pamela just very nicely put there, if you have this quadrant of the institutionalized and the voice, I think it's all about the voice. And we really have to try to 
to access these people that are very, very much heterogeneous and distributed all over the labor market and try to engage with them. And that is not very easy. So what we've tried is to put up a number of principles that we think should be addressed in collective bargaining to ensure that people can both benefit from the increased flexibility that is on offer when working remotely, but at the same time, really trying to protect trade protect trade union and workers' rights. So that is the balance we have to strike and it's not easy, but let's see what, what we can do. So first of all, what are the issues we want to talk about here? When you talk about the benefits of remote work, it's mainly regarding increased flexibility, um, work-life balance. A lot of people enjoy the fact that they save time on commuting, et cetera. So that is very obvious. But then, and that is not necessarily something very much talked about, there are also some challenges related to remote work. And that you might have experienced that yourselves. Some people experience isolation. Some people start having mental health issues. Some people see that they have really lower levels of productivity depending on what your task is obviously but you can also see that um, there is an intensified workload and longer working hours very often happening because of remote work because there is no framework of how to protect people from working too long when working from home so with all that um, in mind, we have started establishing key principles, the first one being the freedom of association and collective bargaining. This for us, obviously, as trade unions is key. So employers must ensure the rights to form and join a trade union and remote work should not weaken social dialogue and collective bargaining that is already in place or will be put in place. And it's very important that employers should provide unions with the access to the remote workforce. So uh, provide contacts, provide email contacts, provide job titles and names. And we have already seen that a lot of companies are hiding between data protection as an argument for not providing trade unions with the access to the workers they would like to talk to. So that is a very, very important bit. And also there should be secure digital spaces where workers can meet and exchange as if they would be meeting in real life. And it should be a digital space without the presence of the employer. So that is very important too. And that is not always the case. So this is a big challenge for us, let's say. Um, employment rights and relationships with remote workers. So it's very important that we maintain the same collective bargained rights and conditions for remote workers. Um, talking about inequalities, we don't want to see um, a division of classes of workers in the office who benefit from all the rights and then people working remotely that we totally forget because we don't see them on a regular basis. Remote work should not be a means to introduce atypical contracts. It should be seen rather as an alternative and a complement and addition to office-based work. So this is especially nowadays when we think about hybrid work. And it should definitely not lead to longer working hours or an increased workload. It should be really the same set of rules should apply whether you are in the office or at home, it doesn't matter. Which also means that the issue of isolation could be mitigated by employers really reaching out to their remote working staff and maintain a relationship with the staff um, also at an individual level. So this is really important. Remote work, also a very important point, is something that should be voluntary and reversible. So that means that if somebody wants to work remotely, he or she should not be excluded from remote work unless there is a very clear justification for it. Um, but also it should be voluntary. And if somebody really wants to go back to the office full time, there should be no impediment to that and no obstacle. Also, remote work opportunities should not be an excuse for companies to close workplaces, cut costs, or undermine working conditions. And that is something we also are very afraid of that with companies now somewhat 
telling the media, oh, we are all staying at home and we are so nice to our employees because you don't have to go back. Well, of course, you are saving costs. And of course, it's your employees that have the energy prices they have to pay in the electricity. So of course, it's nice for you guys, right? I mean, ha -ha. so please know this is not an argument for just keep people in a remote work situation that when they actually do not want to have that. So be aware of that. Um, also, and that very much links up with our topic today, the equality aspect, and especially it has been mentioned, and it's a very important point, the gender equality aspect. So remote work should be available without discrimination or gendered stereotypes. We think very often, and it is very much also proven in your data you've shown today, there are a lot of female workers working remotely because they have to try to combine different tasks and also care duties, etc. But if we really want seriously neutral and gender neutral and diverse remote workers, we have to look into a cultural shift at work to an equal sharing of care and household duties so that also more men would want to engage with remote work in the long term because they have the same opportunities and access should be affordable and good to public care services so that people can actually do that. So this is a very important point. And it's also important in the long term when you think about the gap in salaries, but also the pension gap, because of course you want to have a diverse workforce working remotely and it shouldn't just be the women. Just very quickly, there's also a greater exposure risk to domestic violence for when, when working remotely. So that shouldn't be forgotten. Another point regarding equality, and I will try to be brief, is equal access to training and career development. I mentioned it. So just because you don't show your face every Monday in the office, it doesn't mean that you should be forgotten when people network uh, amongst colleagues, when the boss actually thinks about who could get a promotion, etc. Remote workers should have the equal access to career development, to training, and so on. And it should happen, the training during the working hours, so that there aren't any disadvantages either. And trade unions should really work together with the employers to develop these inclusive training opportunities. It's very important, of course. And we have been very briefly touching upon that surveillance and monitoring of remote workers it has been shown in one of the presentations is a big issue it has been on the increase since the pandemic and we really feel that this has to be limited and it should be also a topic of collective bargaining and the surveillance of remote workers and data storage for disciplinary aims should be restricted i can talk about that for longer but i won't do that now <laughs> but um, very quickly of course the respect for the working hours and that is linked obviously to the whole topic of the right to disconnect that should be installed and should be um, a clear part of whenever you talk and discuss about remote work and want to negotiate about it digital disconnection should be something you immediately think of and you need a collective approach to that but also the buy-in of the management and it should be very clear that the physical presence requirements in the office cannot be translated one-to-one -one into your presence as a remote worker, because you know you can't stay in a digital meeting for seven hours in a row. Nobody does that, obviously. So the, you have to make a kind of mind shift to engage into these questions and to really find solutions that would be working for remote workers. Health and safety, very quickly, the core question here is that the employer should be responsible for the health and safety of all workers, non, regardless whether they're working remotely on the office premises or mobile in any other form. And so the employer should really provide the opportunity for a regular direct contact and for socializing opportunities. That's also an issue of mental health, which is very important. Work equipment and remote workspace costs, I mentioned it before, there should be either or probably the best solution that the employer provides the, the equipment that you would need for remote work. But if there are any extra costs for the workers, there should be a fair compensation of the cost that you have actually undertaken just to perform your work duties. 
And it is important to clarify that before you start remote working. So the, that should be somewhere put into your contract as a remote worker, who is paying what cost, so you have a clear scenario when you engage in remote work. Um, very quickly, before introducing or extending remote working rules, it would be important that there is some sort of assessment whether that can work. There should be a clear information to all workers of what are the obligations, the responsibilities and the rights of all the parties involved. And of course, we would like to be as trade unions involved into all those different aspects when we negotiate on remote work. And just to round this up, basically, I wanted to provide some good practice examples. Um, in Spain, and I'm sure you have heard about that already, there has been a legislation on telework in 2020 based on a social partner agreement. And you also have sectoral agreements in Spain regarding the banking sector, but also in telecoms with Telefonica that have been very progressive. Um, in Ireland, another example, we've got AIR, the telecom operator who has an agreement on agile work. And they are actually uh, at the moment uh, looking into a new bill for the right to request remote work in Ireland. So I think that's something really interesting to follow up on. And also you have in Austria, a work agreement, a remote work agreement of the social partners, um, which is from 2020, I believe. And that's also very progressive. And I would like just to finalize here, give you some uh, key elements if I find my... Yeah, here we go, because what is interesting with all of those agreements that are obviously very much located in the national context, they all address specific points that come up in our principles. So the key points of these agreements are equal pay and treatment for remote workers. That's really the number one demand. Ensuring health and safety provisions and the digital disconnections is also something coming up all the time. Um, Covering costs for work equipment is another really important point that comes up. And also the digital access for unions so they can engage with remote workers. Um, obviously there are far more agreements already made or being negotiated at the moment. I don't have the complete overview here for you, but um, it's something to be followed up. And um, if you have any further examples, we're always happy takers of that. At yeah, so with that, I would like to close my presentation. We've got a dedicated website as well. If you want to look at that and get some news, just get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers and thank you for keeping up time. Um, now, I do encourage everyone who is listening remotely to post questions in the Q&A box. I hope you can type in there. If not, use chat or let us know that it's not accessible. And um, please, the, the floor is now yours. Um, are there any, any questions uh, you would like to pose to our panelists? I must say it was quite interesting to also see the, the overlaps in the topics. We did talk about platforms and then we did talk about remote work in more traditional setting. And yet some of the challenges were, were the same, uh, such as integration in the company process on one hand, so the difficulty in upgrading in, in, in the value chain and then lack of access to training because you disappear from the radar. So the, the te mediated work mediated by, by technology has many common features irrespective of, of the context, which really shows us that the, the challenges should be approached uh, holistically and not really separating platform economy perhaps from from the other segments of, of the labor market sure if you can briefly introduce yourself perhaps that would be helpful thank you Hi. My name is Aida. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo. I work at the ETUI. I'm a senior researcher at the Foresight Unit. I thank my colleagues and, of course, the invited speakers for this very comprehensive panel. Um, I have a question to the researcher at ILO, and I would like to. Well, I'm very interested in the human machine interaction and how the agency of people can overrule or not. Uh, decision-making by machines or by algorithms. 
And um, you mentioned that uh, there is a lack of access of the workers to the machine techniques or the algorithm techniques and solutions. And there's also a lack of, um, of protection and um, uh, access to dispute resolution. So in, in, in this um, dimension, in this situation, what do you think that it needs to happen in order to have or to achieve agency of workers vis-a-vis -vis the machine interaction? And um, well, of course, my second or underlying question is, what's your opinion about the new rules that the European Commission has been put forward on specifically regulating the machine interaction called algorithmic management and in bringing up some kind of remedies from, from other pieces of legislation? Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the room? Maybe we'll collect a couple. If... Silvia, and then... oh, thank you very much. Um, Silvia Rainone, also a researcher at the ATI. Um, well, my question was prompted by the last presentation, but could be directed to anyone. Uh, with the remote work trend, I you made me think that actually, the in a way, the benefit that workers have going in the office and having a physical workplace are somehow denied. And the first, beside the socialization aspect, there is also the capacity to organize and the exercise of collective rights. While through the uh, algorithm management and data use, the remote work still have the control component that a physical workplace will guarantee to the employer. So you somehow have an, control remains there, but the capacity of workers to organize and contract that control is lacking. And how do we enforce those fundamental human rights of freedom of association and right to strike and et cetera? Do we need something more tangible now? And big questions, I don't know. I have a question about uh, agreements on, on telework. It's not the first time that Unir Europa is publishing guidelines for trade unions for the negotiation of uh, remote work or telework. And I would like to know what are the really new points in the guidelines regarding uh, past guidelines or documents? What, what has really changed with the, 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 the pandemic? Uh, in, in this aspect. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jose. I'm uh, from Erasmus University, uh, coming from the Netherlands. And uh, I wanted to ask something regarding the, uh, the platform work survey. I, I was looking at uh, a map from the University of Leeds in which they have identified different protests and demonstrations around the world from uh, platform workers. And uh, I remember they identified a lot of uh, workers from, from delivery companies such as Gorillas, Frink, and they are protesting, of course, to improve their working conditions. But if we took a very strict definition of platform work, particularly the one you, you, you cited by Colleen, uh, also the one referred in the uh, directive proposal of platform work, mm -hmm. these workers would not be considered platform workers, right? Because they are not being uh, matched directly with the customer. They are uh, employees of the company, in this case, Gorilla, Spring, et cetera. And so, you know, they would not even be identified as such. And my question is, to what extent platform work uh, and platform workers is also a political identity? And uh, to, to what extent we are contributing or maybe going against this possibility of, uh, you know, workers coming together under the same umbrella to, to fight for, for their rights? Uh, because seriously, I really don't see a, a, a huge difference in terms of the working experience, someone working, uh, for Frink uh, doing all these deliveries of groceries versus someone working uh, for Uber Eats uh, doing exactly or almost exactly the same, uh, but just with the difference of their employment status. And just the last point would be also to what extent we are focusing too much in the employment status, because I know that a, a lot of uh, uh, proposals uh, not at the national level, they are encouraging to, to, to 
recognize these workers as employees of, of the workers, but this does not uh, provide them the opportunity of collective bargaining if they are, for instance, uh, hired by a third party. So just to give uh, the, the, the example, this company just eat take away from, from the Netherlands, that is also in many other countries, they are um, hiring the delivery guys uh, as formal employees, yet they don't have any formal, sorry, any direct relationship with them. They are being hired by a third party. So yes, perhaps now they have other workers' rights, uh, which is, of course, they are important pension, access to social security, but they are still, uh, they are not able to come together, organize, and fight for their rights. I think that would be the, the last one. Are there more? Okay, so last yes. question. Hi, I'll try to be short. Uh, my name is Noah Odra. I'm from the German Federal Employment Agency. And my question is uh, for the first speaker. Um, you know, there's the EU Artificial Intelligence Act, a draft report that just came out, and they also speak about platform work, uh, I think, in the next three. And I just wanted to hear your opinion on how that will maybe you know, try to tackle some of the challenges that have been mentioned, or if there's more regulation needed on that. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is uh, Emanuela Preti. I work for uh, CHIS, uh, the Italian uh, um, Trade Union Confederation, um, and I am also uh, a member of the um, European um, um, Council of NL. Um, I, I just uh, more than a question, I have a comment, but um, it's something kind of uh, I put this as a as a subject to 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 reflect together on that because I think it could be really um, um, a good thing to um, to analyze this. Uh, frankly speaking, I, uh, I would like to congratulate all the the, the members of the panel, uh, but. For for me, uh, particularly interesting, I have to say, um, has been the intervention of uh, Pamela Mail. I congratulate you because I think that you uh, put in your presentation an element uh, quite new from my point of view, at least, and I just would like to share this uh, thought with, uh, with you all. Uh, when you, um, you, speak, uh, you speak about, uh, um, let's say, the, the business um, to business uh, platform as a kind of uh, outsourcing sourcing uh, 2.0. Uh, if this is the case, I think that we as a trade union, so we could uh, cover uh, kind of uh, segmentation that you refer to your presentation, your presentation, because uh, in, at least in um, most or every, uh, let's say, uh, big companies, big groups, uh, we all have a kind of corporate social responsibility uh, agreements and uh, covering, uh, let's say, not only a guarantee, not not only let's say um, workers' rights for the workers of the group, but also for uh, workers um, working with us. So in the, for the uh, let's say um, all the. Uh, the chain of uh, the supply chain we, we work with. So it's a kind of an ele of element that we, I, I never personally, I didn't, I didn't think about that so far, but you opened me uh, kind of uh, innovative thoughts about that. And maybe it could be, uh, uh, let's say, a kind of, uh, uh, let's say, element to work on and uh, to dip into that and try to fundamentally um, try to find new solution for avoid avoiding let's say the divide that, the, that exists between uh, workers of the platforms and the workers within the group so uh, thank you so much to all of you um i'm very glad to to share these thoughts with you thank you thank you so now we will have um, just about 10 minutes uh, I, I would like to give floor to, to each of the panelists in turn perhaps in the reverse order of presentations and just uh, building on, on the last question I think it's it, these are very good points and uh, if you have also some reflection well currently at the EU level what we have on the table is a directive that really addresses the employment relationship do you think this this will fix mo most of the problems or actually the, the elephant in the room is still there not addressed by just employment relationship um, and I will give floor uh, to Birka as, as first. Yes, I will try to respond to, to a couple Two of minutes. those questions. <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> um, 
Well, let me just take it in the order of questions uh, asked. So first of all, the question regarding control at the office, etc. I think control is a key word here because the problem that we face is that at the workplace, when you're in a regular environment, of course, you can more easily connect to your colleagues, etc. And the problem is that in a remote work setting, uh, very often what happens is that people might have new colleagues, but they've never really met them within two years because you haven't even seen that person. So how would you want to establish a personal bond of trust, which is very important, especially for trade unions to engage with workers in the first place when you've not even ever met that person. So that relationship of trust uh, versus the control um, of the employer, this is something which makes it very difficult. And I think that the issue here, how to solve that is digital organizing. We have been working on that for a long time at Uni Global and Uni Europa to actually train our trade union colleagues in using the digital tools that are out there to really get in touch with those remote workers, creating that digital space I was talking about. That is one of the really important tasks of unions nowadays. Um, second question, very much thank you for the question you asked about what has changed with the pandemic and why you would have new principles. I would say they are not that new and you're right that since 2007 we have been working on, on teleworking agreements, etc. Um, the change I see nowadays, there are two elements that are new as regards to, let's say, traditional teleworking situations. It's the level of uptake of remote work because a whole economy went remote with a pandemic. This is like unseen. So that has been a huge societal experiment, if you want to see, and has actually a proportion that we could never think about before. That is the first thing. And the second thing is, together with that, the level of digitalization and new technology to survey and monitor workers has been immen immensely increasing. And the algorithmic management and automatic decision making capacity that we have nowadays has totally changed the situation of a teleworker because with old teleworking you were still thinking that okay we have some control mechanism um, but that has been exploding nowadays so that we have to face new challenges specifically on that. So I think that was the, the biggest difference between let's say a remote work agreement nowadays and the telework agreement from 2008 or something. Um, I hope that replies a bit to, to the question and how to tackle the challenges with regards to the AI Act in Europa is working also together with the ETUC on the AI Act and trying to provide amendments you mentioned Annex 3, the famous one where we talk about um, elements, uh, for instance, in recruitment that are AI driven and that should be um, tackled by the legislation. What well, we think that this is not sufficient, it's too restrictive, and it would be a lot better to have a standalone legislation under a different article that is not um, single market oriented, but more social policy oriented to really talk about employment and the link to AI. And that is something where I think the platform directive is probably in a better shape as opposed to the AI Act that is in a totally different perspective when it was actually um, edited. So I think that is, there's a lot of work still to do. So in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, um, I think that um, in terms, thanks you for, you know, appreciating kind of a way of looking at things a different way. And in fact, that's exactly right. The idea is that looking, looking at things in terms of a supply chain perspective, when in terms of how the labor market gets uh, segmented through these developments, um, of course, the whole the challenge is that in traditional supply chain um, types of uh, approaches where you had regular companies, you at least had you know people to negotiate with, you know, <laughs> and so the big challenge with platforms is that that is much more difficult. Um, um, in, and some of the actors you're dealing with, where you have some kind of huge platform in China, Showmetry, you, it's very difficult to find out who your negotiation partners would even be and so forth. But you're right. I think really a very interesting idea is that if you can get companies to kind of sign on to the kinds of work 
that they're outsourcing and who's it going to and how bad the labor conditions are, um, how, how bad the wage conditions are, you do make a real inroad in, uh, in, in the first step. Um, in terms of things that have to do with the things like the Artificial Intelligence Act and so forth, um, trying to target algorithmic management and the fact that it has all kinds of controls without any kind of regulation is definitely a really good move. On the other hand, the thing that worries me a little bit is the kind of regulations that happen, which is there's two, if they're not monitored and also if they're not stronger, the, the door to go around the regulation is very large, particularly in institutionalized contexts that aren't strong. Um, so there might be countries in Europe which have a much better chance of actually um, regulating it based on the directives, but others that, that won't. And so I think that the kind of monitoring guidelines have to be much stronger. Um, Omar, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm going to answer to this question on human machine interaction. And also one of the first questions you raised, Angiska, on the offline labor market versus platform labor market. So coming down to the whole issue of the human machine interaction, actually what you do see is that on microtask platforms, especially, you have the entire processes, the work processes algorithmically managed. So actually there's no communication that exists between the worker and the client per se. So, you know, you cannot really raise with anyone if there is any kind of a problem. So in that kind of a situation, I think what would be very important is to ensure that the clients as well as the platform operators somehow actually respond to the communication uh, that is sent by the worker very politely and substantively on the issues. And I think as of now, there is no mode or mechanism that is there. And I think that would in some sense, build up a transparent process where you could have an exchange and you can understand what actually went wrong. Now, the way the algorithms are set up for the task are sometimes on a majority voting system as these are tasks that are quickly done in few seconds or a few minutes sometimes. And I think that is something that needs to be looked into more carefully. Now, coming to the whole question of access to algorithms, yes, we do have the AI Act, but we also do realize that to a very large extent, the algorithms for much of it is part of the trade treaties. It is part of the e-commerce trade rules. So I think the extent to which we would be getting access to it is a big, big question as of now. And looking at the way the AI Act is moving as of now, there's very clear uh, tensions that you see between the labor and the capital here. So I think it depends upon to what extent we could have the transparency of algorithms being made available to the workers or to the unions per se, I think that would be something, a big question. Now, coming to the whole question of uh, what the kind of inequalities we see between the online uh, and the offline labor market. I think one of the important points that I do feel, which we do need to keep in mind and not get down to the whole issue whether all of the tasks that are being done should be at the minimum wage level is that much of the occupations that you have in the traditional labor market are bargained occupation wages. So I think what we need to get into is a discussion that companies, platform companies do not classify themselves as tech companies, number one. And even if they provide a whole range of occupations, then the kind of payments that they do make should be somewhere related to the occupation wages that are actually agreed upon. I do understand that there is a complexity here because you do have pl platforms operating from one country, clients from X number of other countries and workers from around the world. I think there the issue should be what should be this uh, collectively bargained wage that should be the base bottom 
below which it should not be there. And I think this is the only way you can then allow that workers from certain parts of the world do not start underbidding or doing it for free of cost and actually going about it. The second thing is reviewing the way workers get access to work. And here the whole issue is around how the ratings and the review mechanisms actually work. And we also do know from our own research and our own surveys that certain times platforms actually promote certain workers, even if they have bad ratings, they remove those bad ratings and ensure that this particular worker is high on the rating. So, you know, there are a number of practices that are going on, which many of the surveys do capture. And I think we need to see how there is fairness that is built upon and how workers from certain parts of the world are not discriminated, both with regard to access of work and also the type of work that is actually provided to them. Uh, we are already running over time and there are more questions appearing in, in the chat, for instance, about the interaction between offline and online labor market, which is a really good point because the online economy is quite often parasitic on having another job. The, the earnings are just too low to, uh, to have only one employment um, like this. I'm not sure whether, Walter, are you able to compress an answer to all the questions in under a minute that would also <laughs> close the, the panel? <laughs> I'm able to compress, but I can answer all the questions is a completely different issue. Um, just to say, I'll talk a bit about the, the precariousness and, and the fact that when we look in more detail about all this analysis we're doing, essentially it seems that the jobs do just have a lot of elements of, of precarious and, and low paid uh, work in them, the platform work at least, um, and, and with some new elements like the algorithmic management, like the dispersed workforce, but so it shouldn't be seen as a completely different type of work, essentially. Um, and, and it is a, a, a new form of, of precarious work and trying to get as much out of workers with paying them as little as possible to some extent. Um, employment status is, is not everything, I think, but it is a very crucial element because, I mean, those things you mentioned, the, the pensions, the sickness benefits, those are not nothing. They're quite important um, in, in contributing to limiting that precariousness a little bit, especially when you're talking about uh, insurances and, and social insurances as well. Um, but we do see from, from research as well that the, some of the key issues remain on, on top of this employment status. So employment status is important. It's definitely not everything. There's uh, pay remains very important. I think Uma showed it very clearly as well. A lot of this work is actually unpaid and that's a, a problem. And we see that in our platforms, in our study as well. So it's not, uh, it, it seems this way in all countries. Uh, health and safety is an important issue, and uh, the ability to organize. When and we see our colleague Kurt, who I don't think is here, but he's done a lot of work on uh, organization of, of platform workers and, and of different types of workers. And essentially, there are a lot of different forms out there um, with collaborations with the traditional unions, with new grassroots uh, forms, but also, crucially, it's much more likely where there is this sense of community. You mentioned a bit... Um, so some types of online work are very hard to organize. Some forms uh, think of Deliveroo, for instance, where they have uniforms and stuff, but does lend itself more easily to a sort of collective voice. Um, I don't think I can answer everything. There was also a question online about, what was it, informal labor markets? And um, so I think, yes, that, that is to some extent true. It competes with all these types of precarious work. And in some countries, that's more informal. In other countries, it's more the low wage type of jobs. Uh, but I will differ very much over regions as well. Um, but that's what I have to say on that, I think. Thank you. Um, so we will close it here. Uh, there is a coffee break uh, for another almost half an hour. And uh, quarter past four, we start uh, the next round of panels. Thank you very much for being here, for taking part in the discussion. Thank you to everyone who is listening online. Um, and I hope to see you throughout the conference to have more of those exchanges. Thank you.